Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's event. My name's Chris Brown. I'm here on behalf of Pluto Press. Now, as you know, we're all here to launch James Marriott and Terry McAllister's new book, Crude Britannia, How Oil Shaped a Nation, which is officially published tomorrow on the 20th. And uh, if you haven't already pre-ordered the book, then I obviously encourage you to do so. Um, it's available as a lovely hardback and as an ebook as well. And you can get 30% off if you order that from plutobooks.com. You just need to use the coupon CRUDE30 at the checkout. Anyway, we'll put details of that offer uh, in the live chat in just a minute. <clears throat> so we've got a fantastic lineup on the panel this evening, um, and I'm going to be handing over to Caroline Lucas, who's going to be chairing tonight's event uh, in just a moment. Uh, but before I do that, there's a couple of bits of housekeeping we're just going to go through real quick. So... Um, there's going to be a Q&A tonight as part of the event. So if you do have a question for any of the panelists, then uh, just put it down in the YouTube live chat and we'll be forwarding that on to them. Um, and lastly, if you want to find out about our other upcoming live streams, uh, then you can subscribe, of course, to Pluto's YouTube channel. Uh, we've got some really great stuff coming up in the pipeline over the next few days uh, as part of Radical May. Uh, Radical May is in its second year now. Uh, it's an international multilingual program of roundtables, talks, debates and events with some of the world's leading uh, radical thinkers. So if you fancy more of the kind of chat that we're going to be having this evening, then do take a look at the full program. Uh, I think that's on RadicalMay.com. OK, I think that's enough from me. So it is, without further ado, my great pleasure to hand over to Caroline. I love Vinted. To tonight. Caroline, over to you. Thanks so much, Chris, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to have been asked to chair this evening's event. Um, in terms of format, just to let you know a bit about that, Terry will introduce the book and explain what led to its publication. James will do a short reading. And then I'm delighted that we're being joined by four amazing guests who will then have a, a discussion based on questions that I will ask them and hopefully some questions that you will have put into the uh, Q&A function as well. And let me just quickly introduce who we have uh, on the screen with me. Uh, Gail Brad Bradbrook is the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion. Jake Malloy is a North Sea trade union organizer. Susan Daliwal is a climate justice campaigner and creative. And Dave Randall is a musician and author of Sound System, The Political Power of Music. So it's a great panel. Um, but just before we get started, I was just going to say a few words, really just to set the scene. And I suppose, the first thing that I wanted to say was there is an extraordinary timeliness about the publication time of, of this book. It offers a really vivid and compelling and very human account of how the oil industry has shaped Britain, how its influence has defined our lives, our politics and our culture. We hear the stories in this book, both of those it's enriched and those it's abandoned. And you get the sense as its final chapter ends that we really are at a crossroads. And I was struck by the fact that the authors give the last word, not to oil executives, but to a 10 year old climate activist, Elsie Luna. And after quoting her, they conclude, and I quote, in the ruins of an oil world, the new is being built. And that really frankly is how it feels right now in the policy world as well, particularly as we start hopefully to emerge from the COVID crisis in this country, there really is a sense that people don't want to go back to normal because normal was nowhere near good enough. It failed millions of people and it was destroying the planet as well. I think there is a kind of tangible sense that that government can do much more than it ever pretended it could do before. It can, when it chooses, intervene in the public interest. It can find the money to house the homeless, at least for a time. It can find the money to write off 13 billion pounds of NHS debt pretty much overnight. It can find the money to pay millions of people to stay at home. And it can, for a while at least, choose to put health and well-being above profit and growth. And now people have had a glimpse of that. It feels to me that they're not gonna let that go. And so to me, the crucial question is really whether the new will be built fast enough, because there is such an urgency to do this. Net zero by 2050 is nowhere near ambitious enough. Greta Thunberg famously says, act as if your house is on fire, because it is. Well, when your house is on fire, you don't dial 999 and ask for the fire engines to come in 30 years time. We need them now. 
but there are really interesting signs of change. Yesterday, because you might have noticed the publication of a remarkable report from the International Energy Agency, the IEA, which made the case absolutely clearly and categorically that all exploitation and development of new oil and gas fields must stop this year, and that no new coal-fired stations should be built if the world is to stay within safe limits of global heating and meet its climate goals. Now, leaving aside for the moment, as I've said, that net zero by 2050 is far too late and it leaves far too much to be done by far off, untested negative emissions technologies, that is still a pretty loud wake up call. With the exception of Denmark, very few gov governments currently intend to halt fossil fuel exploration, certainly not in that time frame. Our own government is continuing to license new oil and gas fields in the North Sea, despite some pretty meaningless rhetoric about introducing a new climate test, which could only possibly tell you really that more exploitation means more emissions. We know we can't afford to burn our existing stocks of fossil fuels, so the idea of prospecting for, for more is, is hugely perverse. Not only that, but we have a, U a UK law, which is a legal duty on the relevant authorities to, and I quote, maximise the economic recovery of oil and gas. Now, how on earth that law can still be on the statute book when we're supposed to have a government who tells us at least that it aspires to climate leadership, frankly, beggars belief. The cognitive dissonance, or, or to be more honest, the gross hypocrisy could, could hardly be greater. But there, there are these signs of change. I wanted to just quickly flag a new campaign that is really building to try to introduce what they're calling a fossil fuel non proliferation I'm not gonna be able to say it, a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So learning from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and trying to put in place some architecture which would enable all countries to leave fossil fuels in the ground. Because there is a growing network of civil society, indigenous communities, youth, business, academic and other leaders, all calling for this treaty to foster international cooperation, to end expansion, to wind down oil, gas and coal production in keeping with 1.5 degrees, to properly support and resource a just transition, and to accelerate the move to clean energy. And there are cities like Los Angeles, like Vancouver, like Barcelona, who've already endorsed this treaty along with hundreds of organizations representing millions of individuals who've called the, for world leaders to, to stop fossil fuel expansion. So these are the kind of bold and imaginative policies which we so urgently need. But I would just conclude by saying that if we're to mount the best possible challenge to the fossil fuel industry, then we need to know it to understand it, to get under its skin, to really appreciate the influence that it has on our politics, our society and our culture. And that is where this book, Crude Britannia, is so invalu invaluable. And I want to hand over now to one of the co-authors, Terry, for his reflections on it. So over to you, Terry. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline. And thank you to Pluto Press and particularly David Shulman, the commissioning editor. <clears throat> who we went to with this idea of a book in a particular way, and he got it instantly and has been uh, enormously enthusiastic all the way through. Um, so yeah, I'm Terry McAllister. I'm a co-author with James Marriott. James is a campaigner. Uh, he's written three books on oil, and I'm the former energy editor of The Guardian and have spent pretty much all my life in kind of covering business, social issues and, and the environment in journalism. We'd worked together for a number of years uh, before we actually started to write the book. Uh, James uh, provided research from Platform, the campaign group that he works with, and I used that in a lot of Guardian stories and always found it to be um, interesting uh, perceptive and accurate. And so when I came to leave The Guardian in 2016 and wanted to write a book, I talked to James and he'd got the same idea. And so it seemed uh, we should work together uh, in a cooperative way. And I think it succeeded uh, beyond our, our dreams, really. Um, the idea of putting this composite together, as Caroline very um, eloquently said, it seemed to us that although there was a lot of campaigning against oil companies, there was a kind of um, a lack of understanding uh, of the kind of history of it, and that's nothing to take away from any of the climate campaigners. If you talk to 
oil executives or anyone involved in the industry, they know a very narrow kind of field. They, they don't see the holistic picture. And that's one of the things we really, really wanted to do. We wanted to put this really small detailed knowledge that we had built up James and I over a long period of time, but put it into this huge kind of holistic context. So we thought it would take 24 months. It took five years. <laughs> it took much longer than we expected, but I think it's worth the wait. We're, we're absolutely delighted with the end product and we hope you will be too. Um, the strap line of the book is how oil shaped a nation. And that's, as Caroline again was saying, it's, it's the way the politics, the economics, and even the culture of Britain has been changed by this industry. But conversely, we wanted to show how you could read Britain, its social history and otherwise, by looking through the lens of this particular industry since the Second World War. Crew Britannia is a journey. The, it was a kind of intellectual journey in the sense that we wanted to, we had this idea that maybe Britain, the dog, was being wagged by oil, the tail, and we wanted to see to what extent that was true. We didn't have, we, we had an idea, but we didn't have a, a kind of set view as to how influential or not. So that was the journey that we went on. But it was also a physical journey. We actually physically visited four key regions of Britain, the northeast of Scotland, obviously where the, where the North Sea um, is so important, Merseyside, uh, South Wales and the Thames Estuary. And those were very, very large um, refining and chemical centres. And we wanted to show how they benefited, how they'd lost out, um, or just changed as a result of oil losing its primacy and the um, beginnings, the stirrings of renewable power and how that had affected those regions. So we tracked down uh, senior politicians. Uh, we talked to people like um, Michael Heseltine, who played an important part in industrial policy in the 1980s, all the way up to um, people who tried to do something like the Green New Deal, which was Rebecca Long Bailey. Um, we spoke to Ben Van Burden, the chief executive of Shell. We went to The Hague to do that. And we also visited super secretive oil traders um, who astonishingly allowed us into their homes in the Surrey Hills. Uh, we talked to technicians, refinery workers, trade unionists like Jake, who we're going to hear from in a minute. Uh, climate activists like Gail and Suzanne, who we'll also hear from, but also filmmakers and music. And we wanted to set that kind of con cultural context, which is where Dave comes in, um, who's also here tonight. Um, music is important to us, but it's also important in the book. And uh, it, it fascinated us to discover that um, Groups like orchestral maneuvers in the dark could, could produce a song, a, a hymn to an oil refinery, Stanlow. Um, more recently, we, we see people reflecting, particularly Dave Slovo um, group, who's been reflecting climate um, change. Now, this is not a heavy book to read. Uh, it's deliberately not a kind of academic tome or, or um, complex. There is detail, but there's, there's a lot of um, humor, there's a lot of lightness, and actually what James is going to read in a minute from the prologue, and you'll, you'll get a flavor of, of the sort of lighter side of it. We, we're not gonna go into the, the detail there. Um, but we also wrote with, a, with a, what we like to think was a bit of humility. Um, we didn't pretend to have all the answers. We did want to hear all the views of all parties. We did take seriously the views of, of, of kind of serious oil executives, as well as um, Elsie Luna, who um, told me she was going to be on this call, <laughs> um, which so I hope she, she is. Um, we were guided early on by a comment from Helen Thompson, who's a professor of politics at the University of Cambridge in the city where I live. She said she she writes a lot about um, sort of petroeconomics, and she said, I think it's difficult for people to think about oil. It's like a parallel world because it's so big, it permeates everything. 
So the oil industry um, might be quite visible on the high street. I mean, I can see from my window pretty much a shell garage, but um, in other ways, it's hidden in plain sight. And certainly it doesn't like to be seen publicly um, influencing government um, or uh, embedded in the psyche of ministers and large parts of the body politic. But if you look at foreign policy alone, you can see this wafer thin gap between what the UK government has been doing historically and to the present day and the needs of oil and gas companies. Britain's colonial involvement in Nigeria, Kuwait, Trinidad, clearly these are areas which have very, very important petroleum or gas interests. Equally, Iran and Iraq uh, were always considered part of Britain's sphere of influence, part of the informal empire. Uh, was the invasion of Iraq a war for oil? Well, there certainly was no talk of invading other deemed dictatorships like Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe. So we show the way North Sea oil was used as a laboratory um, by the free market policies of Margaret Thatcher in terms of um, making BP the first privatization program, um, the role of oil in the miners' strike. Equally, we look at more contemporary issues of the way oil retreated from Britain, the deindustrialization, which many people deem to be important in Brexit. We also see the way that um, the oil industry has changed. The traditional oil majors, BP and Shell, take a lot of heat in their annual general meetings, which we've seen this week, that they're actually retreating very fast and giving way in places like the North Sea to these much more shadowy, unaccountable private equity firms, which will never hold an AGM, and equally foreign state-owned groups from China and the Middle East, very inaccessible if you want to put pressure on them. And in this current period, when the revolving door between government and business is under media scrutiny like never before, and we argue that big oil showed the way. It was the Cameron government, the one that gave a desk to Lex Greensill, which invited former BP chief executive Lord Brown into the cabinet as lead non-executive director. And you can see following him a whole stream of BP executives who used to work with him um, going in the same direction, ending up as chief executive of the civil service, say, like John Manzoni, who was the former head of um, BP refining. Many other BP executives followed, Tony Meggs, Vivian Cox. And in the opposite direction, you see politicians like Lord Robertson, um, who was a defense secretary, becoming a consultant to BP, while jo Sir John Sawyers, uh, former head of MI6, um, is now on the BP board. Former defense advisor to the prime minister, Sir Nigel Scheinwald, has been on the Shell board for 10 years. And interestingly, many of the senior politicians today actually worked in the oil industry. Liz Truss, um, very much a center of attention over her deals in inverted commas with Australia um, and other things. She used to work for Shell, as did uh, former Minister of State for Europe, uh, Sir Alan Duncan. Former Lib Dem leader, Vince Cable, was a chief economist at Shell. Um, Armed Services Minister Lord Robatham in the past worked for BP. And even Chatham House, the most esteemed international affairs think tank, is, is stuffed full of oil men acting as senior advisors. The point we make in the book is that this cocktail of government and fossil fuel threatens to allow big oil to set the parameters for energy policy. Interestingly, um, Britain has made some big advances in terms of uh, emissions reductions in recent years, but a lot of it comes from manufacturing being outsourced abroad or by closing down coal-fired generating plants rather than touching North Sea oil and gas. Equally, you can see how BP Shell push carbon capture plants so that gas, at least, can be used to make hydrogen or other alternative fuels. 
for all this, the oil industry, far from being the sort of big power broker that it was certainly in the 1980s up to the 2010s, has been on the retreat. And we track the birth of the environmental movement and the key role, particularly played by women, some of whom are here tonight. So this book is about oil, it's about people, and it's about place. So what conclusions do we come to about the future? Clearly we in nature are badly served by the current phase of high octane capitalism and the environmental degradation and inequality that it produces. New forms of ownership, democratic, governmental and community based are needed inside the energy system to ensure that it works for the future, not just for immediate profit. So oil is on the defensive. Indeed, as we heard from Caroline, the International Energy Agency has said it's time to stop drilling. But companies and governments with vested interests in oil coursing through their veins are not going to go down without a fight. It's important to understand our own personal addictions to oil, the existing power structures, and how they are interwoven with government if we're to move on from a fossilized world. We believe Crew Britannia, a social history, a travelogue, but also a climate action handbook will help you do that. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Terry. Um, and now I'll hand over to your co-author, James Marriott, for a short reading from the book. Thank you, Caroline. God, I am Europeans. Take me back to beautiful England and the grey, damp filthiness of ages and battered books and fog rolling down behind the mountains on the graveyards and dead sea captains. Let me walk through the stinking alleys to the music of drunken beatings, past the River Thames glistening like gold, hastily sold for nothing. P.J. Harvey, The Last Living Rose. First, we visit the ruins. We follow the manor way down through Corringham towards the river's edge. This road was once busy with petrol tankers, those that were laden ground up the hill, those that were empty passed them as they rushed towards the refinery to refill. It was a constant back and forth, bees coming and going from the hive day and night ceaselessly. Now the road is almost empty. As we drive from the rib ridge, the estuary is laid out before us, fields, scraps of marshland and beyond the wide brown Thames merging with the sea. The tide is far out and there are a few vessels in the shipping channel. The Kent Hills to the south are sleepy grey forms. Between the 1940s and the 2000s, the mouth of the Thames, 50 miles east of London, was Britain's major zone for oil refineries and gas importation docks, similar to the Elbe near Hamburg or the Rhine at Rotterdam. In the late 1960s, around 15,000 men and women were employed running three refineries, working on building three more, on operating a couple of gas, gas plants. Storage tanks and chimneys dominated sections of the horizon. The flares and lights of the plants punctured the night sky. Oil companies built towns and villages, housing the families who moved in from across the country. The refineries dominated the life of the region. Workers at Coriton joined the Pegasus Club, its clubhouse and archetypal 1960s building up on the ridge. The club had sections each devoted to a different activity. There were sections for swimming, Sunday football, bowls, tennis, sailing, golf, cricket, hockey, badminton, drama, filmmaking, camping, karting, rifle shooting, horticulture, angling and carnivals. The shipping channel was busy then with tugs and pilot boats nipping between tankers, carrying crude from the Middle East and smaller bunker barges delivering petrol or diesel to depots upriver or up the coast. The sky was hung with plumes of smoke from chimneys and power stations. But now, after two generations, this industry has almost gone. The last refinery closed in 2012. We parked some distance from the gates of the old Coriton refinery, hoping that there will be a delay before the inevitable visit of the site security guards. To our left is a wide plain of pale brown concrete, acres of foundations for storage tanks and cracking towers, pipework and buildings. In the middle distance is a set of hills formed of rubble and dust. On its ridgeback, a JCB digger lumbers along. Soaring above it all, 
is a solitary chimney, a sandy colored tube rising 300 feet into the air, topped by a ring of black paint and a tiny handrail. The view of the estuary from up there must be extraordinary. Near its base, the chimney has gaping holes where the few steel flues that fed it with fumes have been ripped away. This machine has been dismembered. Apart from the distant rumble of lorries and the beep beep of reversing trucks involved in demolition work, it is surprisingly quiet. A robin sings powerfully from the bare branches of a cherry tree that must have been planted to bring a touch of colour to the avenue that led to this great industrial facility. It seems that the nature of the marshes is reasserting itself after a century-long interlude. Above a gatehouse at the entrance to the site flaps a shredded Union Jack. There's clearly someone in the building, but they don't bother to come out. So we walk across the parking lot towards an office block with Thames Enterprise Park emblazoned on its side. It's relatively new, but there's a rusted heavy chain and padlock around the door handles. We peer into a hallway littered with detritus of clothing and indecipherable corporate leaflets. Eventually, a man approaches us in a high-vis waistcoat emblazoned with a company logo. He's in his 50s with black stubble on his chin and black work boots. Contrary to expectations, we're not really bothered by our presence. We stand beside him for a while, gazing out over the car park and the men and the machines who are painstakingly destroying one of the old administrative buildings. I've been here 15 years, a security guard for BP, for Petroplus, for Vopac, for Thames Oil, for Thames Enterprise, and now back to Thames Oil. The refinery went through many changes of ownership in its 60 year life. It was built by Sacconi Vacuum, which evolved into Mobile, who later sold it the plant to BP. We survey the almost empty car park. This place used to be full of people coming on and off shift. There were 800 staff here when Petroplus closed it in 2012 and loads of contractors. Among the vehicles on the tarmac are a number of minibuses, bringing guys who are working for Brown and Mason, the demolition company. Mainly, they're blokes from the north of England. They left the big chimney as a historic monument and blew up the other three. There's no sense of bitterness in his voice, just resignation. The scale of the deconstruction of this place is dizzying. The plant closed over five years ago. Since then, hundreds have labored to level the site and still the work is not completed. It will have taken longer to pull this machine apart than the two years it took to construct it. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you so much, James. And I think that excerpt kind of demonstrates that as well as being such a comprehensive social and economic and political history, this is a book that is also really beautifully written, hugely accessible, lots of, of really human stories. So I hope those introductions have, have whetted people's appetite to, uh, to read the book. But I, I wanted to come to a bit of a discussion about some of the issues that it raises. And I was going to um, start with Gail Bradbrook because Terry rightly said, Gail, that the oil industry won't give up without a fight. And XR has done so much to take the fight to the oil industry. You've done so much to raise public awareness about climate issues. And I wondered what your reflections are over the past few years. How do we move from that shift in in public discussion to a decisive shift away from the oil and gas industry? Where do you think that the fight next needs to go? Thank you, it's a, a really big question, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think the first thing I, I just want to say when I'm listening to that reading and um, I'm sitting here as a, a daughter of a coal miner and um, my family lineage, the men were miners for many generations and, um, and I actually feel sad hearing about an industry closing because I've been through that process. And I think one of the key things is that the environmental movement gets set up as if it's against working class people. And it's a deliberate divide and rule tactic by sort of the elites, really. And um, we have to resist that in, in, all, in all possible ways and, and, and feel really together. Uh, and sometimes I think by, by XR focusing on the obvious suspects, I'm not sure that we make that message str str strongly enough, um, that, that of the, 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 the need for justice in the transitions, because it is one struggle. Um, then the other piece is that it, it's important, I think, 
to keep saying, why are we failing to act? Why are we not going into emergency mode? And as been indicated here, we have a political economy that's wedded to growth and profit and that is inherently and deeply corrupted on many levels. And it's impacting people and creating crises on many fronts. And we have to take on the system. And that's part of what we've been doing in XR and part of um, a, a sort of thread called Money Rebellion. We've had artists vomiting up oil in front of um, uh, investment uh, outfits and being glued to oil conferences. And very recently we had a triumph actually. One of the things that we really call for in Extinction Rebellion are citizens assemblies, essentially like juries to look at how we make these transitions in a just way. And um, we have sort of had a mini version of that in that we'd had activists that had occupied and damage the Shell headquarters. And they took that to a jury of their peers. Uh, they were being tried and potentially sentenced for, for, for years, some years between them. And the jury let them off, even though they didn't have a defense in law. So the, what this says to me is that ordinary people, when they hear the arguments, are very convinced. Um, we will be uh, launching very soon an earth tax strike why should we pay the taxes to the government that they use to subsidize the fossil fuel industry? So in, instead, that money will go to an earth regeneration charity. It's just the percentage that is used for environmental harm. And very recently, we've been involved in um, supporting a crowdfunder that's led by an organization called Uplift, which has taken the oil and gas authority uh, to court. So it's so a legal move. So I, I think I don't think there's a simple answer that there's one thing and one message. Uh, I think we have to keep pushing forwards on a, on a number of fronts. And I think our togetherness in that is really important this year. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that for now. Thanks. No, thank you very much. And I, and I think that bit you started off with in terms of dividing and ruling is, is, is a really strong point. And at that point, I saw Suzanne nodding, I, I think. And I wanted to ask you, Suzanne, what you think we could learn from the indigenous led resistance to fossil fuels that you've been involved in and, and what, what kind of, yeah, what lessons are there from there for us too? Yeah, thank, uh, first of all, it's great to be with you all here in this virtual space. Um, I think first and foremost, it's to put the climate crisis into a historical context. And if we're thinking about Britain and its identity to involve its colonial tentacles into the psyche and the uh, makeup of that country. So I think the first thing is to understand that this crisis started in 1492 with the beginning of the devastation of territories of biosystems such as the Amazon, the Canadian tar sands, and that started with that settler colonialism. And that that violence, which continues now um, in Gaza, as we're seeing, is center of this crisis. So that's the one thing that I've understood and also to understand tipping points. Um, so when we're looking at the climate crisis, we've kind of gone a little bit backwards in the past few years in terms of the climate literacy and in terms of understanding that keeping the fossil fuels in the ground means working hand in hand with the communities that are fighting to keep that oil in the land, different uh, resources as well. So um, and the other thing is to think that we can disconnect justice and the climate crisis for me when I hear that it just boggles my mind um, because they're absolutely interconnected in our, in our minds and our bodies and I think the other thing that I've learned from myself from doing this work is that centering Indigenous rights, centering climate uh, justice means that you're going to have to deal with the white supremacy and the racism of the environmental movement itself to do that, to continually have to re-educate about colonialism to fight for resources and to fight for those spaces. So the other things, you know, there's many things around the actual um, legal ways that we've been fighting to keep those fossil fuels in the ground, as well as stopping fossil fuel extraction. We've also been fighting that these projects have the free prior and informed consent of indigenous communities, that the violence against indigenous communities is also what's at stake when we're trying to keep these in the ground. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, I could, I could go on and on, but I think the, the core message there would be to understand that indigenous communities and many of us have been core to um, architecting the, the financial challenges to these projects as well on a rights basis, uh, as well as a climate basis as well. So the moves that we're seeing in the industry now have come as much from a rights basis as well as a climate justice basis as well. 
Thank you so much. And and you picked up a little bit there on culture. So I wanted to come to, to Dave and, and ask him about how you think oil has formed British culture and what role could music and popular culture play really in, in changing public attitudes towards public action? Sure. Well, um, I mean, one of the surprising and I think very effective things about this book, as James is reading and indeed Terry's introduction indicated, is the fact that the book quotes several pop songs um, which really underline the degree to which oil and its products have sort of seeped into the popular psyche. And, um, and it's true, you know, that I grew up with one of the romantic notions of freedom that I grew up with was the open road and a full tank of gas, you know. And it's still the case that people feel that they get status from ownership of certain gas guzzling cars or even private jets. And of course, you know, when you hear the things that Suzanne just mentioned, um, when you think about the wars that have been fought to obtain that oil, when you think about the dodgy politicians and dictators and states propped up in order to ensure its ongoing supply, that all becomes very problematic, doesn't it? Um, but certainly that's the way a lot of people have felt and pop songs are always uh, a window onto the world in which they're, they're written. Now, we all agree that the world needs to change and, um, and I do think that music has a role to play, but I'm, I'm, and I'm going to come back to saying exactly how, but, but if, if I may, I'm just going to talk a bit more about strategy and tactics, because I think we need to be really serious about how we can make sure that this change actually happens um, now. And, um, and I welcome the contributions that have already been made. You see, another thing theme that's developed in the book is that quite often when well-meaning um, left-wing politicians have tried to do the right thing, um, in my book at least, when it comes to the exploitation of fossil fuels and the management of energy and so on, they have been defeated. And I think that they have been defeated because of this narrative that we can't really upset the owners of big business and there are no businesses bigger than the oil companies you know that's the kind of the orthodox thinking for a lot of a lot of politicians in government and um and so in in section one of the book there's a fascinating story about tony ben's efforts to manage um north sea oil in what i thought sounded like a very sensible way but of course he was defeated first of all by the right wing of his own party and then by the Thatcher government coming to power who completely privatised North Sea oil. And, um, and you see similar things, I think, when you look at the Corbyn project, which of course borrowed heavily from the Green movement in terms of policy, uh, when that was doing very well in 2017, um, sure enough, I, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that the success of that project started to put the wind up the 1% as it were, or perhaps the 0.1%. But um, certainly Corbyn was smeared in the newspapers that they own. Um, those smears were then amplified by the BBC and indeed by the Liberal media, including The Guardian and The Independent, I think. And, um, and of course, the electoral project started to fall apart. I mean, the smears weren't the only problem. I think the Brexit was also a, a, a real problem for for the Labour Party at that time, but um, but but the electoral project fell apart, and and this sort of problem, this sort of opposition, will come up time and time again. So, it seems to me that we need three things to converge if we're actually going to get a result. Yes, electoral projects. You know, yes, we need to back progressive uh, politicians being elected to positions of power, but we also. I think we need to build a mass movement, people who are willing to take to the streets, people who are willing to put on public meetings to create their own media and so on, which is why it's so fantastic that Gail from XR is on this panel. Uh, and we also, I think we need to work very closely with the trade union movement. We need to make sure that workers are willing to go on strike, including climate strikes, which is one of the reasons one of the many reasons why it's so brilliant that Jake is on this panel. So I think we need to bring these things together and we need to encourage people to 
be political in all of these ways. And, and here's where I come back to music. You see, I think that in a sense, that's the most important role that music can play is to give people the, the confidence and the courage to become political. You know, why does a worker decide to take that difficult decision to go on strike? Why does somebody decide to give up their game of football on a Saturday afternoon to go on a demonstration? And I think the sort of the 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 background music, um, to put it metaphorically, but also the music we listen to carefully, I think that that's one of the things that can help to to create the sort of atmosphere where those things are more or indeed less likely to happen. You know, there's nothing inherently progressive about music, but I do think it has an impact on the way that people think and feel about themselves, each other and the world that we share. Now, so I'm gonna really what I'm saying is... Really what I'm saying is that we need to stop singing about cars and start singing about this urgent need to become political. And sure enough, that is starting to happen. There's a fantastic, and I will end on this, there's a fantastic coalition of of artists. I mean, there are several, but probably the best known at the moment is Music Declares Emergency, set up by Faye Milton, the drummer of the Savages, and supported now by the great and the good, uh, including Brian Eno, who I think is probably the most committed of, of the sort of the famous signatories to this. Um, so he, he's playing a very positive role. So there are exciting things happen happening, uh, but we need more of them to take place. Brilliant, thank you. And, and so so sorry to, to begin to cut you off because you know we could go on all night and, and well into the, the weekend. I think this is a fascinating discussion, but thank you. And I think everybody actually has kind of teed up Jake brilliantly because the the <laughs> the theme of justice and 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 equity has been right from the start. And I want to ask Jake what you think a, a just transition actually means. Lots of people talk about it, but what does it really mean for oil work and for your union members? And how do we avoid the kind of catastrophic impacts that affected the coal industry, which was so brutally closed? Because I've been so struck by, by all of our speakers, and indeed from Terry and James too, having that real sense that we've got to go together on this. We, we must not allow the divide and rule. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's um, inspiring to hear the, the previous speakers talk in those terms because there's a real risk of creating that division if we don't get the messaging right and if we don't get that that collaborative working to 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 address what every oil worker knows um we are in a crisis we're in a, a, a climate crisis and and you know i've been around the industry for 40 years um as each decade's passed I've, I've thought to myself how how are we managing to continue here we were projecting 20 years for 40s and we're, we're into 50th year and it's still going but um, it is a finite resource and, and it will absolutely end it's just a question of when and then we move into a resource which is infinite and I, and I think that is a significant difference and one that should focus minds for for the future in terms of a just transition um, we need a strategy, first of all. We haven't had a strategy since since Mrs. Thatcher sold the pass. And and it's a strategy that has to deliver for society and it has to deliver for, for the economy, obviously. Um, the model used by Norway in, in the, the exploitation of, of their oil and gas um, with the creation of the Sovereign Wealth Fund could, could easily, I would suggest, quite easily be adapted for the exploitation and uh, of, of the, the renewable sector, uh, the exploitation of our natural resources in, in terms of wind um, and, and tidal power and, and everything else, um, hydrogen production. But as I say, we need, we need a, a strategy and we need that, that strategy around manufacturing. We haven't built a single turbine, we haven't built a single blade, we haven't created um, the, the foundations for or very, very, very few um, turbines that have been installed thus far. Um, we've got to ensure that we address the decom piece rather than allowing what's going on just now, the, the dumping of a lot of the the, uh, the infrastructure on the beaches in, in Bangladesh and, and regions like that. We've got to deal with the, the depletion process and the, and the domestic transition. 
because we're going to need to carry society along. If, if we start knocking doors and telling people they're going to have to change over from natural gas to electricity and at their own cost, then we've got a problem as well. So we need to bring them along. And we did that, if you go back, I can just barely remember it, um, when we moved from the, the old town gas, as they called it, the toon gas, to, to natural gas. Um, and we've got to ensure sustainability. Um, and if we get it right, we, we, we wouldn't be talking about fuel poverty in this country. We wouldn't be talking about the NHS funding in this country. We, we could absolutely deliver a model for, for the, the world um, to enable them to likewise transition because we cannot leave it to the markets. That, that's failed us. It's, as the book demonstrates, it's failed society, it's failed, it's failed the, the world, uh, and, and we need now to address that. And I, I'm touched by what Dave was saying just now about the piece about Tony Benn. Um, you know, he tried to retain some degree of state ownership and, and some involvement with the state, but failed in his, his endeavours, and, and subsequently Thatcher's ideology um, saw the whole lot sold off. We are seeing that same ideology continuing now with the renewables you, you know it's the, it's the Norwegian National Oil Company that's building the biggest wind farm on the planet off the coast of England right now it's them that are going to benefit and it means that you and I as taxpayers are, are going to ensure that the, the, the people in, in Norway continue to, to benefit from fantastic pensions in their retirement age because they've got a national energy company doing the business. We don't. We don't have anything like it. All we're doing is passing out subsidies and, and passing out billions of pounds to these corporations on the premise that they're going to come here and invest. That, that cannot, cannot be the way forward. That cannot be the model which we adopt um, if we're going to deliver um, a fair and just transition. And, and just, I'll just finish by saying that, you know, as Caroline said, we've just come through a major crisis, which you saw the government print money out. Um, we've got another crisis now. We've got a climate crisis now, and that, that dictates that they should and could and should take, take control. Uh, but I think we've also got to acknowledge that this is a global crisis. And, and what we do here in the UK, um, if we get it right, if we if we demonstrate how it can be done in practice, as I say, could stand as testimony for regions like Africa who are going to resist this change with every sinew they, 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 they have because they're just on that starting blocks and real terms for a lot of those regions down there. You know, we've got people in Mozambique right now and, and other areas who are just at the infancy of, of oil and gas exploration. Um, that's going to take a lot of convincing and a lot of a lot of work to change, and, and similarly th throughout uh, Asia and and South America. So, uh, don't lose sight, please, of, of the fact that, that shutting down the North Sea tomorrow will not necessarily have the impact which which we think it would have in terms of the global crisis that we have. We've got to to to, to address it on a global basis. You know, for example. We're building turbines in China using the mankiest coal on the planet to create the steel, to put these cheap steel models on the back of diesel burning ships and sail them half around the world. And that's maximising economic recovery. <laughs> come on, come on. No, um, I think we've, we've got to develop a, a collaborative approach and take society with us to create that just transition. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, I've got such a, a dilemma now because we've got very little time and some fantastic questions in the in the um, in the chat, which I will um, explain in just a second. But also, I would love just to hear perhaps some of your reflections on what each other have said. So what I'm going to do, we've got five or six minutes. Um, and what I'm going to do is to invite you to either make a, a reflection on what one of your colleagues has said or to answer one of these two questions. Uh, in the chat. And the first question was um, from Edred Whittingham, who essentially is saying, where should he put his efforts? You know, basically, he's involved in a political party, in the Green Party. He has been arrested for, uh, as part of XR, but he's also in academia. 
in a sense, where do we best put our efforts is his question. And then a fantastic question from Chris Brown, which is, I think to summarize it, it's really about the fact that that kind of analog age of, of oil, there is some nostalgia to it. And how do we create a new culture fast enough to make that feel exciting and compelling and 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 wonderful enough to want to move towards you know how do we paint that picture of a of a greener society that is compelling enough to say yes we want to go and do that i'm going to shut up because otherwise i'm going to waste too much time i'm going to come back to gail first and if if you can do it in a minute and a half that would be marvelous maybe i just want to flag up i think mariana mazzucato has just written a fantastic book talking about a mission-based uh, economy where you all come together around a, a, clear, a clear mission. And um, it's just a, a, a really compelling case about how we could act together. Uh, we, we're not lacking in ideas, but there's a lack of political will. And the only way that I know that you really get political will is by concerted social movements uh, working together. So um, I, we still need to get out on the streets, folks. And, um, you know, 200 environmental activists die each year in places where they don't get a choice about what they get to do. They're fighting for their land. So, um, you know, I think I think it's on us to, to get out and do what we can and make, do what makes you happy at the same time. Do it with joy and lightness because, uh, you know, we've, we, we've got to be in this for the long haul. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Gail. Suzanne, any reflections on any or all of that? Yeah, I think the first thing is to think about that, you know, this is a renaissance. This is a paradigm shift that we're talking about. And so it can't be created by the mentality that created it. So patriarchal white colonial society. So first and foremost, we need to address the white supremacy and the climate movement itself. The retelling of movement history that's happened in the past few years with XR and Greta we need space to tell the real history of our movements in the UK, because that's how the resources come as well. So the first thing is we need space to retell movement history. And so that, that way we can also bring back in the strategies and the knowledge of how we have been resisting climate justice and challenging the climate um, the oil industry without choosing one or the other. So that's the big thing. We need to get back our deep knowledge. We also need to take care of the mental health of the leadership and the people of color who've been devastated by the white supremacy in the movement recently, because we're losing a generation of those of us who are born with these things intrinsically connected, and we've been erased from the movement. And I spend so much time now taking care of that generation so we can have a space in it. So before we start challenging the oil companies, we need to really look at ourselves. Where's the resources? Where's the culture that's challenging this? And where is the history that has been omitted from the UK climate history and also from the larger history? And then one last point would be to make sure that with Brexit, that we don't go inwards and stay international. If we look at the farmers protests in India right now, that's the biggest movement that's ever happened in history. So when we're talking about other countries don't know how to do it or how we need to learn and be inspired, we need to decolonize ourselves. The rest of the world's really on it. It's the UK that needs to get on board. <laughs> well said thank you uh dave can i come to you sure yeah let me try and address the the last question that you asked about how do we create this um, inspiring compelling vision um i one of the first politicizing things for me was reading a science fiction novel a feminine work of feminist science fiction by marge piercy called woman on the edge of time and i think that the most exciting thing about that book was that it describe the utopia a different kind of society and i think at the moment there are lots of dystopias there's lots of kind of you know um lots of um accounts of the fact that maybe we're living in the end times and we, it's too late we're all doomed i think more utopias would help and again you know music and in particular music festivals have a role to play shambhala is a very good festival which has always had the banner adventures in utopia and they've got very good policies including making sure that all of the food vendors are vegetarian or vegan which so far as i'm concerned is, is a really exciting policy um finally yeah i mean i, I think what gail said is exactly right we have to keep on the streets and i'm, I'm gonna pick a i'm going to end on a quote from the towards the end of the book well not a quote but i'm going to paraphrase because i can't remember it but the ceo of shell uh, terry will correct me if i'm wrong but the ceo of shell um says when asked about moving completely away from fossil fuels uh, we can only move as fast as society as a whole some some phrase to that to uh, like that and 
if you translate that, what he really means is we won't change unless we're forced to by public opinion. So that's the job we have. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and um, yeah, coming to, to Jake. Yeah, I think Dave summed up well with that last um, sentence there. It's ensuring that we've got a, a properly informed um, society in order to, to carry that that weight um, with governments. And as I say, it goes back to that whole just just transition piece. If 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 workers, you know, we've lost twelve thousand workers from offshore this year. It's projected there's going to be another 18,000. And we're hearing all of this rhetoric about you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs that are coming. We haven't seen any jobs yet. I mean, I was talking earlier about visiting a, a vessel in Great Yarmouth last Friday where the workers on the wind, the wind vessel, the renewables vessel, were being paid £3 odds an hour. That, that, that doesn't sit with the idea of a green recovery, with the, the, the just transition piece. And that's happening right around the coast. You know, the exploitation of, of foreign nationals. That's not to say that foreign nationals can't come here and work. Absolutely can. We're, we, we need we need immigrant workers to come here and work, but they shouldn't be exploited uh, in, in the exploitation of our natural resources. So I, I think there's a, a whole societal conversation um, to make to make sure that the, 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 the just part of the transition is absolutely enforced throughout. Thanks so much, Jake. I'm I'm going to pull this to a, a close now, just to, to thank all of our of our speakers, and, and in particular, just to reflect that we started with oil, but we've really got quite deeply into racial justice, class justice, social justice, into generational justice, and it just shows that it, 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 everything is so interconnected, and that we've got a job of work to do within our own movement as well as with the oil industry too. Um, I don't want people to feel that that means that the, the challenge is even greater than when they joined the, the, the webinar an hour ago, um, because there is hope. I want to give the last word to James, who will just do a very short uh, reading from the book just to, just to finish. Thank you. Over to James. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much. On the drive away from Coraton, where we were earlier, we stop off at a petrol station near Basildon, and after filling up, we ask the woman serving at the till about when the lorries come to resupply the underground storage tanks. She's friendly, but all she knows is that it's a BP tanker that comes in the very early morning. She's wearing a shirt with a BP logo on it. So we ask if she's employed by the company. She replies, oh no, by MFG. Back in the car, aided by a chart we've compiled, we put together a trail of how the unleaded petrol got to our engine. The garage with its BP sign we refueled at, refueled at is not owned by BP, but by MFG, the largest forecourt for operator in the UK, itself owned by a US private equity company. It was supplied by a road, road tanker, which although it was marked with a BP logo, was owned by XPO Logistics, a US transport multinational. The tanker driver does a circuit of tens of petrol stations, delivering mostly at night from Thamesport at the old Coriton site. This storage depot is owned by Greenergy, a private equity company from London. The Thames depot also supplies aviation fuel to Stansted, Gatwick, Heathrow and RAF bases such as Honington and Suffolk via the UK's oil pipeline authority. For 60 years, these pipelines were owned by the British state as a matter of national security. Now they're owned by CLH of Spain, whose largest shareholder is CVC, a private equity company registered in Luxembourg. The fuel that is developed, delivered from Thames Oil is supplied to the storage depot by ship, most likely a tanker working for an oil trading corporation such as VTOL, a private company based in Switzerland. The tanker would have arrived from anywhere across the globe, but it could have been shipped, shipping fuel processed to meet EU standards in the refinery at Haldia, in West Bengal, India. Where did the crew that fed the refinery come from? We know that BP has a contract to supply Haldia with oil, but where it does it, well, where it comes from is commercially confidential. At this point, the trail has so many variables 
that we can no longer trace it through the thicket of the industrial world. On the sound system, PJ Harvey sings, past the river Thames, glistening like gold, hastily sold for nothing. We talk it over. So what does all this mean? It means that a decade ago, when these roads were thick with traffic, BP refined fuel at Corriton, their own railway tankers delivered to an array of petrol stations, and we might just have pulled into one of them that belonged to the company. But now, although the traffic is just as heavy, this entire system from a refinery in India to the garage we stopped at is owned and controlled by a mesmerizing array of private equity companies. These, feast, these firms feast on the ruins left by the closure of BP and Shell's refinery. They have moved in on Britain as the big corporations have slowly moved out. For all the talk of the end of the fossil fuels, the boom in electric vehicles and the rise of renewables, the role of the oil in the UK economy remains vitally important. As things return, return to normal after the pandemic, there is still many, as many trucks on the road. There is still as much plastic in the kitchen and pesticides in the field. Yet the control of this bloodstream of, a, of our society is now in the hands of very few wealthy men, entirely hidden from public view, beyond the reach of politicians, many trade unions, and many civil society groups. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Uh, a reminder, if we needed it, about how much political power really is, is at the heart of this whole story and that all of us in our different ways are chipping away at that power, trying to reveal it and trying to reclaim it for indigenous communities, communities here, for the workers and, and so on. Um, thanks every, ever so much to, to everyone who's been part of this debate, everyone who's been watching as well. Um, and it's a fantastic book. Go get it. Thank you. <laughs>